live from the NBC News Radio Broadcasting Studios of KCAA, 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM, located in beautiful, sunny downtown California. Thanks for tuning into the Water Zone. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Starr, along with Mr. Mike Barron, who's in the in the master control room working on some edits and be out here in a second also known around here as Mikey Pena who I always call and together we're collectively known as Da Water Boys. I hope everybody's having a great afternoon. It's a nice day. It's a little cooler today. Uh, it's sunny. Uh, it's a little bit humid. They said there's supposed to be some sprinkles coming. Um, not, not enough to do any help for the lack of water we have in California but that's the way it is and uh, it's uh, yeah, it's California. What else can I say? So, <laughs> hey, we got sound effects now. I like that. That's a that's a good thing. Um, this week, our regular news lady, uh, Miss Chris Austin from Maven's Notebook, happens to be at the Los Angeles County Fair. So she's enjoying a nice uh, day off with her family, a well deserved one. Uh, and if anybody hasn't uh, checked that website out, you really should do that. Uh, this lady is awesome about. Uh, preparing news and what's happening. She follows and knows everybody in, in the water business here in California. And uh, Baven's Notebook is just an awesome site to go to. It has every bit of up-to-date news about what's happening in California, and uh, it's a good thing. Mike and I use it a lot. If you want to go there and also contribute to a sponsorship for her, uh, that would be that would be great. Uh, she didn't ask us to do that, but uh, uh, it, it helps, helps her move forward with uh, her projects, and, and that's a good thing to do. So... Um, Mike and I are going to do the news since he finishes up editing, but I can tell you a little bit what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> in California, water agencies are uniting in opposition to statewide water tax for every customer. If anybody hasn't heard, um, the safe and affordable drinking water fee emerged as an 11th hour effort by Senator Bill Monning, a Democrat out of Carmel, to charge every water customer in the state an additional $5 a month. The money would then fund drinking water projects in disadvantaged communities. And, uh, Mike, what do you think about that? You know, I think, you turn your voice I think <laughs> once again it demonstrates the potential or real conflict that can occur when we talk about water. Yeah. Statewide, you know, there's more than 115 water providers. They joined in the effort and voiced their opposition to the water tax and SB 623. And the Association of California Water Agencies, which is known as Aqua to us, also opposed the bill and mounted a statewide campaign to kill it. We think there may be more opposition to that from the state, and we'll hear from that shortly. But uh, I don't know, when you got all the water agencies uniting against them i don't know but you know the state the state does what they want well i think that they have uh i'm, I'm going to take a little issue with that you know when the water agencies complained about how water reduction goals were set during 2015 um, the state water resources control board came back and amended the the targets and they change the way they were going to hold those water agencies accountable as you remember right. they, they they really moved over to a hey prove prove to us that you can sustain your deliveries for three years during a drought but who but who you know yes there's felicia marcus and her organization but if a state senator brings this up and does it and they pass it how does that affect well there's uh, so a senator might I mean, the Senate might pass it. Then you think the Assembly will just uh, rubber stamp it? Well, what happens if they do? Then what power does the State Water Resources Board have over what they pass as a law? That's what courts are <laughs> for. And that's why, as you well know, that when you're a lawyer and you're involved with water law, you have job security for the rest of your life. Mucho dinero. Yes. <laughs> anyway, but that, that's that's just of an, of an interesting thing. And, and you know... They're looking at adding three to five dollars a month onto the water bills. Will all the money go to if it did if it did ever pass? Would the money always go to that, or is it going to be diverted to just another another tax? Well, I mean, we don't know, but no, I mean we can't. Uh, you have to go back and say what what. And it's kind of like the uh, in the securities industry, right? Uh, what has happened in the past is no indication of what will happen in the future. It's true. So why do we study history? <laughs> you say well, history, just, history repeats itself. That's uh, because we don't study it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of thinking about it. 
So you got some other news there, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. UCR you know, study. Uh, yep. We talked um, about that this morning on a phone conference. Yeah, that's right. And I think it uh, was very interesting because it illustrates uh, what I call the law of unintended consequences. Absolutely. You know, in in economics, but also in physics, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Exactly. Newton's third law. That's right. Uh, that's See, uh, I did Wayne, learn, Wayne, I did, I did learn that, something in college. That's, physics. that's Wayne Newton's third law. Is that right? Is that was his no, first name? No. Was it Wayne? <laughs> uh, uh, Sir Isaac. Doc Nashane. Doc Nashane. That's, that's <laughs> Wayne Newton's. Anyway, um, yeah, and this is, has to do with uh, the fact that in drought, conditions when we're all asked to reduce our water footprint and water consumption that in fact we did during 2015 the whole state of california to the tune of about 24 percent mm -hmm. uh water use reduction and what that does is it reduces the amount of water that is discharged from residences right through right. the through the sewer right and so all your sinks, your showers, your toilets, yeah. everything. Now, I hadn't thought about this, but you still have the same amount of stuff that you're trying to dispose of that goes through the sewer system, but there's less water. Do you think people flush less during the drought or they'll reduce their shower time first? Because you can't control how many times you flush, really. I mean, you can. Oh, you can. You, you, you can, can, but you wouldn't want to live there. Depends. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Depends on, depends on um, you know, your commitment to participating in the water conservation effort, you know, and I, I can tell you that it was took a little doing, but, you know, you, you, there's multiple uses of, uh, of the toilet prior to a, to a flush. I think a lot of people do, do that, you know, it's kind of a multifunctional. And, and, kind of thing. and for breeze and glade, but not in sales. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but what happens is, you know, if you have less water, but the same amount of what they call solutes, right, right the amount of solids, uh, that are going through the system, the concentration goes up. Absolutely. And when that concentration goes up, all of the wastewater treatment plants were designed around some estimate yeah, as to what that concentration was going to be. And they go out of balance, and it's ridiculous. And uh, so then you've got challenges with respect to the equipment that really no one anticipated. But again, the waste treatment facilities you know, they're, you don't hear them whining. You don't hear them complaining. You don't, well, at least I don't, and I don't see articles about that, no. but you know they have to have been challenged uh, because of this. And and um, I think we had a gentleman from a wastewater treatment plant that was a guest of ours yes. who was talking about uh, the fact that, yes, you have more clogging of sewers. There's more maintenance that's required. So bottom line was this, research at UC Riverside was not intended to say you shouldn't save water during droughts. What they were saying is that here is a consequence that was not expected. How do we deal with that consequence? How do we manage with that? So I thought that was, a, a, again, a step in the direction of research that provides additional information for decision makers to use as they navigate these and waters. Gonna, and, and you know, <clears throat> from what I understand and what I've seen at, at one of those places, it's it's you're you're constantly monitoring the water and the condition of the water. As you said, when when they start receiving less of the wasted water, they the salinity is going to rise. There's more pollutants. The concentration is totally different. It's just a whole new chemistry that they got to be prepared for. Yeah, and and you know they're dealing with that, um, and clearly. It sounds like they're dealing, you know, they're, they're being effective, but there has another consequence, and that is with less water going through the wastewater treatment plants, that means there's less water for groundwater recharge, there's less water for uh, reclaimed water use. Mm -hmm. And so even though the amount of water that is uh, recycled within the state of California and then reused is, you know, you know in the teens, mm -hmm. um, Whereas, as you know, Israel, it's about 85% of their wastewater gets recycled. Um, there's still problems that potentially happen when you significantly reduce, like 20%, 25%. But, you know, here's that was in 2015. We're now in 2017, and we're still 
uh, our water usage is still about 17% below what it was in 2003. So these issues have not gone away completely, and so it's good to see this kind of research being being done. Absolutely. We should get those, those guys who did the study. You know what? That's a great idea. Um, hey, there was something else that was very interesting, um, and that has to do with Palo Verde Irrigation District. So that's out in the Blythe area uh, on, on the road out from California to, to Arizona. And what's interesting is that Metropolitan Water District entered into an agreement back in 2004 with Palo Verde Irrigation District that would allow them to pay farmers to fallow land so that they wouldn't use the water that they get from the Colorado River. And of course, that water then becomes available to MWD. And now, 13 years later, Palo Verde Irrigation District is saying, listen, you, you've, you've fallowed so much land here, we're starting to get worried that what used to be a vibrant farm community is going to be reduced because they're selling you the water, in essence, by not planting crops. Yep. And, and, and now there's a lawsuit. Again, another opportunity for water lawyers to um, help clarify exactly what, what should be done. So um, a wholesale agency like Metropolitan Water District, they're looking at a number of different avenues you know, to mm -hmm. obtain the kind of water. We're talking about thousands and thousands of acre feet of water. Um, you know, that's their job. They've got to get it. They've got to be resilient. They've got to be able to supply it to their, to their uh, um, member well, agencies. Well, with an expected growth in California over the next 10 to 20 years, it's going to be, you know, and, 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 you know, speaking of that, like with farms, you know, their uh, up, up north regulations are, are, are really scaring the people, the, the farmers, about, you know, like the Sigma and all that. What are they going to do with all these new restrictions and the, the measuring, the, you know, the pumping uh, restrictions or the measurements and things of that that's going to preclude them from doing a lot of their crops there was an there was an article in the western farm press uh, uh, two people uh, they interviewed um, one was a gentleman named Cameron uh, who was a grower in Redding California he he manages about 25 crops grown across 7,000 acres of farmland that he has in Fresno. And then there was another gentleman uh, that was on uh, our ag show, A.G. Kawamura. Mm -hmm. And he worked for the... Uh, uh, Brown administration. Brown, Brown yes. administration. He was the uh, secretary of agriculture. And they're, they're seriously worried what's going to happen with their farming business. Because you know, the Sigma is going to put some restrictions on them for sure. Well, you know, the, the whole idea with SIGMA, which we know to be the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of right. 2014, and, you know, the first step was to form these um, committees or, or organizing entities around these rural yeah. um, and they groundwater bases. And they're all ready to go. Right, right. And so think about it. The goal is to make those what previously were unmanaged groundwater basins that were being depleted primarily because of the drought, but basically any farmer on their land could drop a well and start pumping water. Mm -hmm. So they got to the point where many of these groundwater basins uh, dropped. I mean, in the Central Valley, what used to, we used to have to drop maybe a well uh, 50 feet to get water. Oh, it's deep. Now it has to go 200 to 300 feet to get the water. So these aquifers, these groundwater basins, it was thought need to be managed. And I, I hold out, maybe naively, but I hold out hope that just as the Santa Ana Water Project Authority has reconciled all the conflict between Riverside, San Bernardino, and Orange County in terms of the, the watershed and the available water that's, that is allowed to go down the Santa Ana River for use by Orange County, that these adjudicating committees are, are going to have the same kind of effect. They don't, I don't think they intentionally want to say, hey, we want to push everybody out of business. I think what they want to do is say, we want to make sure there's water mm -hmm. available, not just this year, but in the next decade and the decade after that. So let's hope that 
the goals and the methods uh, are consistent with working together because we need farmers. Oh, absolutely. You know, we can't we can't point the finger and say, "Oh, you waters use all you farmers use all this water," because guess who eats that food that those farmers? Right, grow? And, and, and actually, the cost of, of of vegetation crops are pretty low in California. Relatively, I mean, we are very very fortunate in California to have the kind of access to vegetables and nuts and fruits that we do have. I mean, they're it's very sustainable. If we have enough water, because they're here in California, they're in our backyard, and we need to think about the fact that they are our backyard, that they are our food shed, mm -hmm. basically. And um, so we're going to have to watch what goes on with the uh, Sigma Act and these. Um, now, the nuts and fruits you're talking about. That's are actually on the trees, not the, anywhere not, else. Not, yes, be, or, not the yeah, people. Not, the right, people right, right, stuff. right. You know, uh, what was I going to say? The... God, I just had a thought, and I, I guess I, my nuts were <laughs> I mean, crazy. I can't remember. <laughs> Gary yeah, Gary. you were just thinking about those nuts and fruits. And, uh, but oh, hey. but no, no, I, I remember. Uh, you know, the technology yet isn't perfected to measure how deep the water really is. Uh, that's another. That's another issue. I know the state's going through. Of really, how do, how can they accurately measure how much water? Well, is really there. When you know that you used to have to drop a well. 30 to 50 feet, and now you have to drop it 200 to 300 feet. Yes, it's you, less, you, but... You, you better start taking some precautions, you know. Now, could you go... And and in, maybe it does go another 200 feet, right? Yeah, don't know. But think about this. What they do know that as you go deeper, the concentration of minerals and salts increases. Higher. That's correct. And second, the energy that it takes to uh, extract that goes more. up. So really... Uh, that's a balance. You know, we have to apply a balancing act to uh, determine how we manage those groundwater basins to be sustainable. And it's going to be interesting to see what kind of consultants. Uh, I, mean, I think uh, cottage industry is going to develop that will come in and help prepare plans and programs to help these organizing groups manage the manage the uh, groundwater uh, basins that, that that they're responsible for because there you do have to measure it you have to know hey we're below our level we have to set a target level that says when we go below this level we have to start so, yeah. managing oh in the conversation we had this morning you and I had this morning we talked about um, how how can a farming business make the necessary technological changes and implementations of new products. It costs a lot of money to do that, and, and there's really not a lot of opportunities from USBR or the rebates or any of the stuff that they can invest that get that kind of money to do that. Well, there's a, there's a program, you know, I don't, I'm not as close to it today as I was several years ago. It's called EQIP, EQIP, E-Q-I-P, but this was a way for farmers to finance through government um, support the investment that we're talking about. Now, it's not sufficient, uh, but it has been used to replace um, flood irrigation with uh, either drip irrigation or with, what are those things called that you, the, create those circle the pivot systems pivot. pivot systems so there has been government funding to implement the new technologies but but not to the level that certainly could be and you know we talked about before metropolitan water district and and member agencies probably spent close to half a billion dollars uh, in a turf re uh, removal program and you got to think for a moment how much uh, flood irrigation could have been converted oh. to drip irrigation, even if you take 20% of that money. And we st have to start thinking um, more broadly rather than in silos and say, you know, we've got to look at our watershed resources together. Well, it, was re it was reactive. It was a reactive uh, knee jerk yes. to, to do that. Yeah. And, and you're right. They need to really put a plan in place and think forward what's what's really the root cause and how can we solve it instead of just doing these knee-jerk things to and I think they you know I think they did go back and they have analyzed and studied and and checked out um, you know what did we learn from this process and certainly the issues around heat island effect around uh, 
runoff, increased runoff uh, during rain, rain, rainy se seasons, uh, all those issues, and really how much was paid to save how much water. Uh, but bottom line is we need to continue to pursue alternatives because as some of our guests in the past have said, you know, the, the solution to our water issues and in California and other parts of the country is that not just one initiative, not just one approach, but it's really uh, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to do multiple things, conservation, technology, groundwater basin recharge, surface reservoir storage increase, I mean, and, and pricing so that we use water resources appropriately. Correct. You know, with, with all the talk about uh, global warming and such, you know, there's a new term, I don't know if you heard it, called atmospheric rivers. Oh, <clears throat> you bet. You bet. And, and, you know, that's something that I, I think the water agencies and the people in California should got, really start thinking about because now they're saying the storms are coming more. And when they come, they're going to be more violent, meaning more more rain, more more uh, precipitation, so and then that's followed by long dry periods. So now you're <laughs> going to get all this. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to chuckle because, uh, you know, uh, so what was it, 2010 to 2016, or 2010 to 2015, with with 2015 being the height of our drought, right? It was the driest five year period in the recent history in the state of California. And then, you know, it was like, oh, we're looking at a new mega drought, right? Remember the talk right. about, oh, it's going to be 100 years of drought. and 100 year flood. We, we can uh, look at the rings in these thousand year old trees and we see indication of these uh, 20 year, 50 year, 100 year droughts. So the talk was all about, oh, this is the beginning of, right. of, the, of the forever drought. Um, then 2017, comes and what do we have we have rain records in northern california now what was it that we were expecting in 2016 do you remember what was what we were talking about at the towards the end of 2015 what we were all hoping for in california was the messiah no yeah. <laughs> besides that i mean about related to water uh, we were looking for el nino do you yes. remember el nino yes so El Nino, uh, I'd like to look up well, and see. that is the messiah of water. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the messiah of drought. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so um, I guess the point I'm making here is there's this new term, atmospheric rivers. I started hearing it maybe two years ago, but it was kind of infrequently used. But we had a lot of atmospheric rivers right. in 2017. That was very intense discharge of water. It caused a lot of flooding in Northern California. Um, Caused a lot of discharge from the from dams and yep. So 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 we just had this dry 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 period, atmospheric rivers, and now instead of talking about El Nino and talking about the hundred year drought, we're now talking about oh no. What's really happening is we have these really intense rain events followed by longer periods of dry. dry well, right. how many? After one set of events, we're we're making this prediction. So I'm a little skeptical. I don't deny that atmospheric rivers are a reality. I don't deny that we just had a five-year drought. I'm not prepared to accept that we're going to see for the next 30 years this cycle. So no, I I, I think it, I think you know. To me, it's putting common sense and science together to try to solve some of these things. And, and you know, there's so many theories flying all over. One side says they're right. The other side said they're right. We don't know. You know, we only started measuring temperature and everything, what, 100 and something years? We really don't know. You know, we, we got to believe that the cycles of the earth have changed and they rotate. Going, you know, there was, there was dinosaurs at one time. Dinosaurs don't exist anymore. Uh, things happen. The same thing can, with this. It's, 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 it's a guess. Science is good to, to learn and obtain facts, but it's still not the end of the line to know what we have to do. Yeah. Well, you know, if in fact this sequence of events, f you know, five to seven years of dry followed by one year of intense rain, what that suggests is, back to what you've suggested many times in the past, 
how do we take advantage of all that excessive rainfall? Water drain. <laughs> Just open up those, uh, the, 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 the uh, Well, cloud seeding. How come we don't do a lot of cloud seeding? Yeah, you know, um, maybe that's something that isn't as developed, or maybe there's some resistance to how, how far do you want to mess around with Mother Nature? So that's back know. to modified uh, genetics and, <laughs> and that we're changing the... Changing. It's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. Yeah. <laughs> but um, bottom line is that if we're going to see these more intense, shorter periods of rainfall and we do see rising temperatures, then whatever snow does fall in the northern Sierras is not going to stay there as long. And think about it. The Sierras, in an average snowfall year, basically acts as the massive reservoir for one-third of all of California's water supply. It stays in the frozen snow mm -hmm status all during the winter right. and then it starts melting in the late spring and early summer when we need the water and when it's no longer raining what's going to happen if in fact some of these predictions do come true and you see the snow melting much faster we already saw what excessive water going into Oroville what da you know what damage it caused yep. um will you, you could create a scenario where there's going to be more of that because the snow is melting faster, sooner. We're not going to be able to retain more of that water in our own surface reservoirs unless we do build, you know, more. But this wasn't the first rodeo for California on drought. We've had, we've had it over the last 50 years. I mean, it, there's times that we went through these things. You know, I don't understand why people know that there's infrastructure problems. They know that 90%, I'm, I'm close to that number, of water when it rains here, where does it go in Southern California? Oh, it goes, goes out ocean. to the ocean. You know, we, we know there's a need for, for storage. We know the infrastructure is broken. We know the pipes are bad. I really want to see somebody do something with those things. They're not. Well, and, I, and they keep discharging, as, as we saw the last couple of months, you know, when I kept joking about it, and I was serious, though, in my joking. I, I guess I could be happy and joking and serious at the same time, but, but we kept... How will we tell the difference? <laughs> I got to keep neutral. Got to be <laughs> neutral here. So, so that's why I say that. But I, I kept getting upset wa wa watching all this water go out to the bay because we can't fill up the dam anymore because there's a certain level we have to keep it at. So what do they do with the water? They just get rid of it. Why couldn't they collect it or divert it somewhere else? And, and I joke with the water train, but seriously, there's a method for picking that water up and moving it somewhere else. Why didn't we do that? You know, I think that... Sorry for getting hyper No, no, but I, th I think... So part of what you say is, I believe, on point. And I think the general concept of doing a better job of capturing rainfall that escapes to the ocean without negatively affecting the environment, and by that I mean the temperatures of rivers right. and the um, you know endangered species... So, so, so you're right on that point. However, I do think that you are seeing the larger urban metropolitan water districts uh, looking at programs and looking at major investments. I think, you know, there's uh, the WIND Act, you know, the Water Infrastructure uh, Improvement Act yes. that was passed uh, the last year of uh, President Obama's uh, tenure. Uh, I haven't heard much about where is that money because it was a multi-billion dollar thing. Uh, PR companies. So uh, <laughs> they're, te they're, they're doing the uh, – a lot of that money goes, unfortunately, to do what we have uh, identified as voters that is important, and that is you know, do the environmental impact study to pass the California Environmental Quality uh, and Department. That and that takes forever. Yeah, so – but I think water agencies are doing the kind of thing that you're talking about in a variety of different ways. They are working on sustainability. They yeah, are they, wa working on resilience. I, I agree. I agree. At you that know. level, yes, they are. I think what is, where it's missing is from the state and from the federal. 
I, I haven't met I haven't really met anybody bad from a, a water agency that we've dealt with. Right, right. I mean, they all seem very committed to providing that reliable quality water service to their constituents. Um, they seem to know what good investments to be be recommending. There's a lot of science and technology behind that, yep. um, and so I don't want to. Maybe paint too negative a picture about. I think I think they're making progress because back in 1992, when the la when the big drought ended and we had the they didn't call them atmospheric rivers, but no. we had I think they called it El Nino that yeah. that year. Um, you know those crises of extended drought galvanizes attention and public interest in hey, what are you going to do about? A sustainable water supply and so i think that two periods where we've made the most advancements was as a result of 92 I, I agree. And, and the result of uh, this this most recent time but, but as you said and i said it comes it came out of the water agencies people yeah but it, but you know when the when the federal government and the state fund water projects uh one of our guests said they want half of that cost or some large percentage of that be, cost to right. be the local sure. people and that the, the you know, that, let's get in the game. Yeah, exactly. And and so so I think that's good. And I know that there's a lot of, you know, not a lot, but several applications that have been made and submitted to the state of California. And, and I hope that within the next, you know, six months, they'll say, okay, these are the projects that are approved and we'll start to see. But these projects are huge and they take years and years, and if not decades. And billions of dollars. So. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a little break here and go to our commercial and uh, we'll be back. Sounds uh, good. In, in two minutes. So stick around to the water zone. If you're a landscape contractor, you like the strong things in life. A strong crew, a strong truck, and a strong stomach to handle that strong coffee you drink. Well, you want strong? You've got it. Visit Site One Landscape Supply to stock up on professional grade landscape products during our Save Strong customer event. From August 14th to September 30th, we'll have some of the year's best deals on irrigation, lighting, and turf maintenance products from brands like Hunter, First Editions, FX Luminaire, Lesco, and much more. It's our invitation to help you get ahead for next season. And while you stock up, talk shop with our local experts for product recommendations and specialized services to help your business grow. Don't let SaveStrong pass you by. Stop into Site One today for deals on the brands you need to get the job done. Offers valid in store only August 14th through September 30th, 2017. Restrictions apply. See store for details. This is the Schmidt's Yard. Company's coming soon, and, oh, Schmidt, their deck and outdoor furniture's been dominated by dirt. But no worries, there's plenty of time for Scott's Outdoor Cleaner plus OxyClean to work its magic. Its fast-foaming action lifts dirt and wipes out stains from moss, mold, mildew, and algae. Guaranteed. All while being safe to use around plants and grass. Because when company's coming, Dirt's not invited. This is a Scott's Yard. Pick up Scott's Outdoor Cleaner this weekend. Hey, welcome back to the Water Zone. If anybody out there wants to give us a call and uh, ask us some stuff, we'll be glad to answer you. The numbers to call are 909-792-5222. Or if you care to dial a different number, you can do 909 792 one zero five zero and any other number you dial will not be this station so i would try just calling those two numbers that sounds good it's uh, always fun to get a call uh, we oftentimes don't have a lot of time for calls absolutely but uh tonight we do and so if someone wants to make a comment about water issues water bonds we're trying to stump us yeah we uh, would love to hear from you oh you didn't bring you didn't bring the encyclopedia the, it's the, the, the right media, here. It's it's called the Mikeypedia Encyclopedia of Irrigation Knowledge. There you go. There <laughs> you go. Hey, um, I do have some good news though. Opt news that should make you optimistic about the future. Ah. And so, in this uh, article that we talked about earlier from UC Riverside, um, they actually looked at water consumption at the U.S. level. Mm -hmm. And when you look at uh, water consumption at the U.S. level, 1980 is where that consumption peaked. Now, you think about 
how many people have been added to our population since 1980, and yet the total amount of water that's being consumed has gone down, which means yeah. the per capita consumption of water has decreased even at a greater right. rate. So, but don't forget, we had a lot. Of, we had a lot of new technology to well, help to help drive that number too. Aside aside from, you know, would be interesting to see is what was the GDP, you right. know, in 1980 versus what it what it is today. You know, but I bet you it's at least tripled, mm -hmm. and so you have this increase of economic activity, increase in number of people, um, and yet our average amount of water used per person is, is down, yep. as, as is the total amount of water. Now, one of the reasons is one of the biggest users of water was, do you know? It not, it's not ag and it's not urban. It's washing, not rivers. washing your car in your driveway. That's right. <laughs> Without a trigger nozzle. Right. Uh, I have a calibrated thumb. Yeah, there you go. No, no, but but then, you know, you can't leave your thumb on the hose while you go do wash the car. So I have the kids go out. And do, you oh, you stick it up where? <laughs> no, you just squirt them. <laughs> That's right. Hey, but um, now that I've lost my train of thought, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so we were talking about uh, consumption of water. Um, well. I guess I'm just going to leave it because you just really stumped me there when I started thinking. So do about, I win a gift card? I stumped you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, get the hose. But um, I nope. was just say the e the economy has grown tremendously. Population has increased. Production output has soared. Has soared. The technologies that we have available to us today are you know beyond. We really did you even envision what we have today in terms of handheld smartphones back in 1980? No. I mean, it's just amazing. I remember when they came out with a, what was it, a, a 600 baud modem for people to have. Yep, yep. And, I, and we oh. thought, wow, this thing, this sucker's fast. I remember going to 1440 and then Ugh. 2880 or whatever that was. And then, and now, you know, wherever we go. Well, you got more power in your phone than you do in a, in, that you used to have in a large computer. You know, when they, oh, absolutely. You remember the Commodore 64s and the... Oh, TRS-80. Yeah, or, or the Osborne Compact computer, which was yep. a suitcase yep. that weighed like yep. 40 pounds. Of, yeah, it's a portable computer. Yeah, you got to lug the sucker. So I am optimistic that if we've made that kind of progress since 1980, and we today, I think, are moving in the direction of having more awareness about the importance of water to our economy to our food production, to our quality of life, and to the environment, as that knowledge and awareness increases, mm -hmm. as we take in, I guess, become more aware of just how much resource goes into developing that reliable, sustainable, high-quality supply of water, that we will continue to make progress. And as you know, as the price of something increases, there's always innovation to try and use it more efficiently. What do you think is going to be the biggest driver to get water at the price of its true value? What do you think is going to be the trigger to that? And when do you think that could happen? Well, the reason I don't think it'll ever happen uh, is because the price of water is not determined by the marketplace. It's determined by regulatory uh, entities and you have the water agencies that have to uh, abide by what those regulations are so i think that you don't think they'll ever change well you know what do you say never say never <laughs> i think i think um we have to solve the issue that water is such an essential component of our livelihood in terms of we all need water to drink that there's a sense that that we're entitled to have that as a right but what we don't, what we forget is that whenever there is a right to a good or service, somebody's got to provide that good and service. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just appear out of thin air. No, and I understand there's some lawsuits also going on uh, about what you just said about the right to have water that you know people can't afford it, but they have the right to get water. And and so with that happening, you know you've got programs that subsidize. Um, the water costs, you know, to um, low income, that low income segment. 
And I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that could be done within a, uh, a pricing model. I think the idea that during a drought, I would like to see water agencies develop the pricing program that would allow those that save water below their budget to be rewarded financially mm -hmm. and those that go above their budgets uh, to pay that incrementally higher price because then you get the power of the market within that regulatory environment. So there are people that will value the money more than that extra 100 gallons well, let, and vice versa. Well, do you remember we, we were talking to people from Beverly Hills? And I use this as a good reference because a lot of movie stars, a lot of big producers, a lot of wealthy people, I'll just say it that way. They can be from any walk didn't of you, life. Didn't you used to live in Beverly Hills? No. no. Oh. <laughs> Not quite. Um, went there many times. My friends and everybody. Oh, you did. They, they haven't lived there. Uh, but, you know, there's there was homes that you and I knew about uh, that had six to seven swimming pools. And I know the mayor at the time, Mayor Gold at the time, there's a new mayor since... Now, that is a great name for the mayor of Beverly Hills. Yes. I won't even go back into his religion background because it had to do with <laughs> money. So people can figure that out. I'm not making fun of that because I'm part of that group. Yep. But anyway, uh, that, you know, the people that had the six swimming pools and X amount of jacuzzis, they didn't care what the water bill was. Well, they could afford it. They had made their money. And in a sense, you know, I think... That's part of the American way, right? Uh, and they're willing to pay for it, and they're right. willing to pay the, the tier four level or, or even higher. If they well, are. and that's why I think that that kind of tier rate, budget-based tiered rate pricing, I, you know, I'm a proponent of that. I, uh, I think it makes sense because it allocates, it, it allows every person, every homeowner, they every— They can live their lifestyle, <clears throat> and they're willing to pay for it. That's great. And, and those of us that say, you know, we need to minimize our, our water bill, we can buy that basic amount of water that we need at a, at a low low price. Right. And uh, that's the idea. And then the, the higher-price-paying customers that can afford it— basically subsidize those those lower so now now let me ask you a question so now let's jump to the future and now we're in a worse severe drought that we've ever had okay make believe it's three times or five times worse than what we just went through for the last five years now there's really 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 a water shortage the people in beverly hills and i'm not picking on them but just using them as an example or anywhere in the world that's that's wealthy and can afford the seven swimming pools and pay that water bill is it fair for them to use the water and they pay for it when there's a water shortage and other people are really skimping and if they keep using that amount of water, even though they're paying for it, they're using it up and that's going to be less for the mass? One thing I've, I've discovered, and that is when there are uh, the drought emergency, the state of California was able to do things that had never been done before because it was declared a drought emergency. So in the scenario that you describe. I'm confident that the state would once again declare a drought emergency, and as the severity of that drought emergency increases, I would expect the uh, regulatory limits to increase. And if it gets that bad, it then becomes an issue of, first and foremost, you have to have water for fire prevention, mm -hmm. health, health, hospitals, right. schools, and to drink. Now... If you think about it, um, we know that in, in California, about 50% of the water, potable water that gets used in the urban environment goes to outdoor landscaping. And so if we had this severe um, situation, then you'd say, hey, well, if it really gets that bad, then you just basically say only indoor water use. And the state of California has already set a target use level of 55 gallons per person per day. That's already in existence. Right. So I would see that going down and say, hey, you now are going to have you know 40 gallons per person per day. So in that scenario, you could easily, you know, I think survive at 40 gallons or on 40% uh, of the total water supply. And I'm talking about residential homeowners, apartment dwellers, that kind of group. It'd have tremendous impact on Farmers, I mean that they would be the most affected, which means our food prices would would have to you know go up significantly. 
Remember, the good thing about wet years and dry years is that wet years give you a chance to recharge the aquifers. Right. Now, aquifers hold a vast amount of more water than our above surface reservoirs, that's right. right? And so they're designed, I mean, they're not designed, they're naturally uh, have the ability to get us through, you know, three or four that's years a good of question. drought. Who designed that system? Who designed that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one and only. So uh, it all depends on what your, uh, back, you know, what, your, right. uh, what your philosophy of life is. But the bottom line is aquifers, you know, that's why it's so important that this new focus on how do we keep accelerate the recharge of groundwater basins. Right. And and that's why if we can accomplish that, then we can get through a five, six, seven year drought. Um, but it would be painful because you've got so a lot of businesses. So why can't they collect that storm water? The ninety percent of the storm well, water that goes off and bring them back to the, the to, to land and, and, and reinject so, so, them. So I've got a great idea. So we'll we'll create the ultimate big funnel that covers the entire state of California. And when it rains, it gets poured right into one little... How, how do we start a GoFundMe? So, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, GoFundMe, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's uh, that's where I'm going to have to say, as a, as a resident of California, I'm going to uh, be in favor of bond measures that support water projects. And then I'm going to trust that the professionals that have access to those funds as water agencies use those funds most appropriately. Yeah, they got to do, do the right thing. And, and as you said, every single professional, whether they're general managers or technical specialists um, or capital acquisition managers, we've always been struck by their philosophy of wanting to do the right thing. That and their tenacity about doing the right thing. And, yeah. and, and, and like I said, I, I haven't met anybody in a water agency who, who really doesn't have the passion and the fire and the belly to, to get it done. And, and to me, a great example of that is every water agency, every water conservation manager from every agency we've ever interviewed on this show that we've worked with as part of our jobs with Toro right. at water conservation fairs and sustainable landscape fairs. They've always taken the approach where we do not want to be punitive with our, cons- our, our customers. What we want to do is educate, educate them. That's right. and we want to support them and we want to uh, you know, get them technology that will help them be more efficient with their use of water. So, you know, the, the, in- the intentions are, are on Right on on the money and and um, so that that gives me good good uh, optimism for the future. There have been fines I know given out. I mean I I won't mention the water agency. Mm-hmm. I went to one one hearing with a customer who wanted to re, re, redesign his uh, irrigation system, but he was hit with a sixteen thousand dollar fine. Wow! Uh, uh, because. Uh, I mean, well, excessive water and, and, and things. And I, again, I'm not going to say who the water yeah. agency or the person was, but, you know, I, I went there and, and, and my role at that, I was asked by the contractor who we know uh, to go and, and assist in, in, in pleading the case that, hey, they hired this contractor professional contractor who was a good conservation manager. He knew what needed to be done. He had a whole plan in this. And he said, look, the last guy that the guy hired – Screwed up, didn't do a great job. Now they hired the right guy, and he's going to put in this type of controller, this type uh, uh, the sprinklers, efficient sprinklers and all of that, and drip. Water agency said, well, you know, it's a little too late. You know, sorry about that, but here's your fine of $16,000. you got to pay for it. And the guy says, well, can't, can't you see I'm doing this? Here's the contract I signed. Here's the representative from, from Toro saying they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, their equipment's going to be used on this thing. They didn't care. Hmm. And, and, and but, but you're right. Most of the time... They gave warnings, and they made you come to a class for a Saturday and, and teach you about water conservation. And well, I, you know, I still uh, chuckle at the fact that Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz, which has a uh, RGPCD, that's the residential per capita consumption of right. water you know, per person, it, it's, like in the, it's below 50 gallons per person per day. I mean, that's it's great. Pretty, pretty amazing. But what they did was as they... During the drought, they would send out a few people to check and make sure 
people didn't have sprinklers on in the daytime, that they didn't have uh, hoses just running in the water in the street. And when they did find that, they would issue a citation. But you would have a choice. You could pay the fine or you could attend water school. And they had hundreds of people attend water school, get educated. I thought that was a very uh, clever way to say, look, you're not, we're in a drought. You've got to be responsible. But here's a way that you can avoid the fine. Well, unlike unlike the uh, if you get a ticket and you go to traffic school, you still have to pay for the ticket now at use little driving school. So let's take a little break. Let's take a uh, go to a commercial and then we'll take some calls if somebody calls in. And stick around more for the water Sounds zone with Mike good. and Rob, the Water Boys. Maybe we should be the Water Men. I like that. Yeah. The Water Men. Boys to men. <laughs> Do you hear it? Springtime! And folks across the country are excited to get their yards ready so they can get outside and kick back again. And with Scott's and miracle Grow in your shed, it's easy. Whether you plan to grow spectacular plants and bountiful flowers, or enjoy a thick, healthy lawn all season long, now's the time to get outside and fill... Oh, wait. Do you hear that? The sound of great things to come. It's time to fill your shed with Scott's and miracle Grow. Hi, welcome back to the Water Zone with Mike and Rob, and we're debating whether we're going to be Dow Water Boys or Dow Water Men. We have to figure that out. Men, men to boys. I mean, uh, boys to men. Right. Yeah. Is that a group? I don't know. I'm not into music. You're the music man. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my favorite music for them, but they're good guys, I guess. So I was reading that the U.S. and Mexico are set to sign a landmark Colorado water sharing deal. That, that's right. That's a, a new agreement uh, that kind of will supersede the 1944 original agreement between the two countries. Yep. It's supposed to happen on September 26th. And uh, the new accord titled Minute Number 323 to the 1944 Mexico Water Treaty outlines a series of measures that build on the country's current five year agreement, which expires the end of this year, as you were correct. And. Um, so that should be good for them. And well, you know, the thing that strikes me, I didn't know if you... So you remember when we talked about, and I'm going to come back to this treaty issue, but remember when um, we talked about the Santa Ana Water Project Authority? Right. And that back in the 60s, there were all these lawsuits that were going on. And do you remember what the judge decided? He said, we're going to set up the Santa Ana Water Project Authority, and every complainant every participant in these lawsuits are going to supply a, a technical member to right. be part of sapa to resolve these issues in a way right. that um addresses everybody's needs yeah, you talk amongst yourself solve yeah the problem, come back. and then come back okay now that model out of conflict came what now is a very amazing successful entity well believe it or not there's a similar kind of entity called the International Boundary and Water Commission that came out of this 1944 treaty where you have water experts from the U.S. and water experts from Mexico saying, look, there's all these rivers that basically form a border between us and where it's not, where the river isn't at the border, it still carries water that was at the border. There's groundwater, by the way. The 1944 treaty didn't address groundwater. And I read that the population in the border towns has quadrupled, uh, maybe since 1944. And so now groundwater issues are relevant because as these town border towns grew, started drilling. They started drilling <laughs> exactly. So this International Boundary and Water Commission hopefully will continue to do for this new treaty what sapa has done in southern california for the santa Ana water authority yep. and they're also looking at building i think we talked about it on a show previously that their uh san diego county water is looking to do an, a, another, another desal plant down there with mexico oh really yeah well, uh, that'll be done by ide technologies the same one that did the one in carlsbad so that should be pretty well interesting in how that works and and so that'll be the second project for IDE. So 
that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Ah, well, we got one minute or less to go. Well, um, the only thing I will add is Salton Sea. The state legislature approved $200 million to be used to help the Salton Sea. They're getting squeezed. No more Colorado River water and less runoff from ir- uh, ag irrigation. Well, just to let you know, there is a plan, true story, for the, for the water train. They, have a, they submitted a plan to bring water in by the water train. Choo, choo, choo. So it'll be interesting. Anyway, everybody have a great week. I know Mike and I had a great time today. I did. Learned a lot. Hopefully we shared some of uh, information with you, and uh, we hope to hear, we hope that you'll join us again next Thursday. And remember, the most important thing you do, think blue. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.5.